We all want good things for ourselves and our families, but are we looking for the ultimate good of spending eternity with God? We'll talk about the four very important last things tonight. Uh, uh, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome on Father Mitch Pacwa. Welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guests, though, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Anthony the Great, or also known as St. Anthony of the Desert. He was born in 251 AD, and by the time he was 20, he had gone out I think he went in two stages when he was 18 and then uh, again at age 20 he was living with a hermit to learn the monastic life and then went off further into the desert yet people sought him out and he was there in a time of great persecution as well as he last no, he lived 105 years till the year 356 Christianity was legalized uh, in 313, so he was just uh, uh, 62 years old, and he lived 40-some years after that uh, in order to help the Christians after the church was legal and the government tried to take over in a way by denying the divinity of Christ and making it amenable to political issues. He helped people like St. Athanasius and others to stay firm with the faith and be clear in what they teach and courageous in the midst of it. Uh, you can download the life of St. Anthony from our website, uh, ewtn.com. Go to our document library. You can download it for free. Uh, it's the life of St. Anthony, and it's written by St. Athanasius. So we strongly urge you to do that. All right. Well, we have a guest tonight. He may not be from too far away in the world, but he is well known around the world to our whole EWTN family. His various TV series, his homilies at the daily masses here at EWTN, and all the work that he does, plus he is the newest host of EWTN Radio's Open Line, and he will answer your questions every Tuesday afternoon. He's here tonight to help us contemplate the four last things toward which we are moving each hour of the day and night, every one of us. His new book is called the Four Last Things, A Catechetical Guide to Death, Judgment, Heaven, and Hell. And this can help us to pursue understanding those, those are the four last things. So please welcome Father Wade Menezes. Father Wade. Oh, it's good to be here with you again. How the heaven are you? Doing great. Doing great. Good to see you. Man. Thank you. Good to Thank see you. you. Good, good to be to back. Have you. It was enjoyable uh, celebrating Mass with you this morning and also going over your book. Yes. Um, it was uh, it's an important topic because it is neglected. Uh, yeah. People oftentimes spoke back in the 50s and 60s that we were not talking enough about sexuality and procreation and people were too Victorian and uptight to talk about those things. Yeah. Now, that's all we talk about. Yeah. <laughs> and we skip talking, we're too uptight to talk about death, judgment, heaven, and hell, the four last things. Uh, they want to talk about the beginning things for the beginning of life, 
but they don't want to talk about the end of life. Now, why is it, first of all, that you took this topic? The catechism is huge. Why this topic in particular? That's a great question. First, I want to thank you for being one of the endorsers of the book, along with Father uh, Frank Pavone of Priests for Life and Johnette Bankovic of Women of Grace and also Bishop Robert Baker of the Diocese of Birmingham. I'm mm -hmm. very honored to have the four of you endorse the book, so sure. thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, you know, being an itinerant missionary preacher for the Fathers of Mercy, uh, we preach a lot of parish missions throughout the United States, Canada, and Australia. And we do so on different topics. It could be the sacraments, it could be marriage and family life, and other topics within mm -hmm. the church's doctrines and sure. teachings. I came to realize in giving parish missions on other topics, when any one of the four last things was mentioned, let's say I was given a parish mission on the reality of sin and mortal versus venial sin. Well, inevitably you're gonna talk about hell when talking about mortal sin. And I realized that a lot of people don't know the particulars of the four last things. And this at various different times throughout the preaching apostolate of preaching day-long conferences, week-long retreats, mm -hmm. uh, or um, uh, week-long parish missions. So I thought, you know what? I believe God is calling me to do a series on the four last things. And so I set out to do just that. There was a lot of misnomers out there about the four last things. For example, uh, death, a, a very, very scary event, uh, regardless of one is prepared or not. Judgment, uh, no knowledge of the difference between the particular versus the general judgment, and that the, uh, the general judgment will ratify the particular judgment. No, um, no really sound catechesis on heaven. Uh, this image of the fat cherubs we see in mall windows, <laughs> um, you know, and then hell. Uh, God sends no one to hell. Uh, there's no way anybody can go to hell. God sends no one to hell. And I'm like, well, you are correct. God sends no one to hell. They send themselves to hell by unrepentant mortal sin. But hell is real. The church teaches. It's also a doctrine of Holy Mother Church that souls can go there. And while we have formal canonizations and no formal damnations in the church. Yeah, no, uh, nobody has ever officially been damned to hell. Correct. Nobody, but, not even Judas Iscariot. That is absolutely true and correct. But that doesn't take away from the truth of the doctrine of Holy Mother Church that hell does exist and it is possible for souls to go there before the general judgment and to have their bodies reunited to those souls, their souls, at the end of time for all eternity. Um, there's a beautiful quote from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He says, let us work for the food does, that does not perish our salvation. The food that does not perish our salvation. And I, I believe you're correct very much so in your opening comments about uh, we think very temporally minded now as society has progressed uh, since the 50s. And we don't focus as much now on the eternal realities that await us. And uh, the church's eschatology, from the Greek word eschaton, meaning the last, uh, eschatology is the study of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, three of which will apply to each one of us personally, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. Yeah. And since the Second Vatican Council, and this isn't to blame the Council, of course, I like to say that Vatican II is not the cause of us waning from the doctrine of the Church's eschatology, but it is the occasion by which we have waned away from the eschatology mm -hmm. of the Church. Why? Because progressive forces following the Council's closing in 1965, the Council ran, of course, from 1962 to 1965, many of the progressives in the church took the ball of Vatican II and ran in the wrong direction with it. And th that's, that's a very sad truth, I believe, but, mm -hmm. but not to blame the council. I want to make that clear. And it's almost as if the progressives in the church thought that um, uh, judgment, uh, purgatory, hell, uh, were not uh, appealing to the so-called modern-day man and woman of the mid-1960s. And instead, there was this over-focus, this predominant focus on heaven and salvation. And in the truth, Father Mitch, is this, is that each one of the four last things uh, is a complementary doctrine with the other three. Mm -hmm. You cannot focus just on the positive or just on the negative because then you yield an imbalanced view of our world now and of the next world to come. Yeah, there are complaints. Uh, though, I remember being on an airplane back in the 90s, and this one young woman said, well, I left the Catholic Church because all they ever did was preach on hell. Yeah. I said, 
over the last 20 years? <laughs> Are you sure 70s? about that? <laughs> who is this priest that you have? Yeah. You know, because I, I, you just don't. And you're right about Vatican II, um, that you had folks who wanted the spirit of Vatican II, yeah. which meant that there would be no compromise with the progressive element of the church, yeah. instead of the balance that exists yeah. in uh, between progressives and, and uh traditionalists. They wanted to get rid of anything uh, traditional. And Lumen Gentium oh, mentions yeah. heaven, hell, and purgatory yeah. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. as options. Yeah, Vatican II is a beautifully balanced council. Those, the documents are just magnificent. And we still have yet to know them fully, I believe, in the yes. 50 years since the Second That's Vatican right. Council. Even the first one that, that was uh, promulgated, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium on the Sacred Liturgy. So when I set out to write this book, uh, realizing that I believe this was an area that lacked uh, among Catholics, at least in, in the Western world, in preaching parish missions and retreats. Um, I wanted to set out to write it uh, in a very simple way, uh, to spring, uh, springboard from the catechism. I wanted any eighth grade intellect or higher to be able to grab the book and easily comprehend it, easily understand it. The second thing I wanted to do, because it is such a serious topic, is I wanted to write it with a little bit of wit, precisely because there is uh, uh, a reality of, of a, a kind of a, of a daunting uh, uh, cloud over the four last things with the exception of heaven. But, but again, we need to look at the four last things not in a morbid or morose way, but in a joyful anticipatory way. Mm. You know, uh, there's a beautiful quote from St. Therese. She says, um, I am not dying, I am entering into life. Mm. You know, and that was from her deathbed when she was having these violent temptations against faith. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, on his way to his martyrdom in Rome, he says very beautifully uh, to those he's writing his letters to, he says, um, only once I finally get there in reference to heaven, can I be fully a man. Mm -hmm. meaning living fully his human nature mm -hmm. that he was made in, in God's own image and likeness. No more tendencies of concupiscence pulling him uh, while living in the earthly state. Only once, once I'm in heaven can I be fully a man. And again, Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux's quote, uh, just very, very beautiful, that we have to work for that food which does not perish our salvation. This, this is something very important because Life is difficult. Yeah. There's, and for some people, it's far more difficult for, than for others. Sometimes because of sickness, sometimes war, disease, terrible natural catastrophes. Life can be very, very hard. And you have some folks who have no hope for uh, heaven. They have no fear of hell. That's right. And they end up welcoming death. Say, well, if I'm going to suffer, just kill me. Uh, not realizing that putting up with suffering yeah. makes for a more joyful heaven. That will heaven will well overwhelm the uh, f the, the difficulties we have here, while trying to avoid difficulties by killing yourself will open up far worse pains in hell than you were about to suffer here. Yes, absolutely. And I touch upon this in the book about the salvific aspect of suffering, the redemptive aspect of suffering, that uh, no suffering goes unmerited or unwarranted when it's offered up in union with the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember too, I think when talking about redemptive suffering or the salvific aspect of suffering is the doctrine of the communion of saints. Those of us still living on earth fighting the good fight, whether it be persecution like our Middle Eastern Christian brothers and sisters, or those living here in the West with, with cancer or whatever the trial or tribulation might be. Um, as members of the church militant, we're fighting the good fight in union with Christ's cross. Then the members of the church triumphant are those in heaven, and the members of the church suffering are our brothers and sisters in purgatory who are assured heaven. And so this three-tiered hierarchy known as the doctrine of the communion of saints has this real communio going on, you know, us to them, them for us, us to them, them for us, back and forth. In fact, there's a beautiful 
paragraph in the catechism uh, talking about the members of the church suffering, it says that our prayers, meaning the church militants' prayers, those of us living on earth, our prayers for them, the church suffering, our prayers for them are capable not only of helping them, but of making their intercession for us effective. In other words, if the holy souls in purgatory do have an effective intercessory power for us, it's only because what's happening first, we are praying for them. And this is part of that communio, and it's a beautiful doctrine tied to this reality of the church militant embracing its suffering in any form, um, meriting in heaven a higher place because of it, and wanting to live in such a way now, regardless of the trial or tribulation, that we are eternity minded. Now that's a strong point in the book that I make in all five chapters. <laughs> the, the first four chapters are appropriately titled Death, Judgment, Heaven, and hell, the traditional ordering of the church's eschatology. My fifth and final chapter is necessities of the spiritual life, or the necessity of the spiritual life. And in all five, I talk about this very point that um, we need to live eternity-minded. Uh, what do I mean by that? Again, not, not focusing on the reality daily, daily of the four last things, three of which will apply to me personally in a morose or morbid fashion, but in a joyful, anticipatory way. And, and in fact, you endorsers, all four of you, got it when you looked at the book. For example, Johnette Bankovic, her quote says, uh, for the endorsing of the book, she says, this book filled me with great joyful anticipation of what is to come. Mm -hmm. And I thought, she nailed it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Joyful anticipation of what is to come is what I want this book to fill people up with. When I was an undergrad, uh, the, my favorite philosopher was uh, not well known, uh, but he was a Frenchman, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And in his book, The Phenomenology of Perception, he brings out a key element regarding uh, that's related to eschatology. He talked about how your objectives define what you see in the world. Mm -hmm. You don't, you look around, there are all kinds of things in your environment. Sure. A lot of them form a background, but a lot of objects are at the foreground. You know, the, the, yeah. you focus on certain things and a lot of things you ignore. His insight that it's your objectives, your purposes, your goals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that get you to define what you see and what's important in all the things around you. I'm not an electrician. I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the lights and the wires because I would sure. have no idea what I was looking at and I'm not allowed to touch any of the stuff. <laughs> Those are not my toys. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, there are other things I notice, that, you know, books on the shelves and things because I, I read a lot. This is true in regard to heaven and hell. Yeah. If you make heaven your real goal, you will be looking for the ways in which God is leading you to heaven. If your goal is something else than heaven, you will see the things that help you get to that goal, and they may be the things that prevent you from getting to heaven. Right, right. This is, this is a key principle. You're reminding me of a great quote from Thomas Akempis in The Imitation of Christ, uh, book one, chapter 23, which I quote in the book. He says, if you were wise, you would live your life in such a way that you would expect to die by day's end. Now, that might sound kind of morbid, but it's reality. Um, how do we know that tomorrow is not the day that we might be hit by a tractor trailer rig mm -hmm. and die instantly in the, um, in the, in the accident. Um, these are realities and we want our objectives as you describe them from this philosopher 
to be eternity minded, eternal minded. And this in our daily interactions with others as well, whether it be our prayer, our work, our family life, or our recreation and leisure. There is such a thing as a, as a moral recreation. There is such a thing as immoral recreation. Should I be doing this? Do I wanna be doing this? Doing this recreational activity, this particular one, is it conducive to living in such a way that I am eternity minded? The other thing too that I bring out in the book, especially in the fifth chapter, is the necessity to to pray daily for the grace of a holy, happy, and provided for death. That's the, the traditional language of the church, to pray for a, a happy, holy, and provided for death, of which Saint Joseph, the foster father of Jesus Christ, the spouse of the Blessed Virgin, is the patron of. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of the beautiful, beautiful sound tradition in the church that when he died, when Saint Joseph died, he was flanked on either side of his deathbed by the Blessed Mother, his spouse, and by Jesus Christ, his foster son. In other words, the devils didn't have a chance to get to him, yeah. okay, and that's pretty powerful. What do we mean particularly by the grace of a holy, happy, and provided for death? Well, namely five things. Number one, not to die unrepentant of any mortal sin, okay, especially willfully so. Number two, to receive the anointing of the sick. Number three, to receive Holy Viaticum, one's final Holy Communion. Number four, to receive the prayers of commendation for the dying. And number five, to receive the apostolic pardon, which doubles as a plenary indulgence and wipes away completely any temporal punishment due to sin by the church's own authority. Now, it could be that because death is instant in an accident, that one cannot receive any or any one or any all of these, okay? That's okay. The fact is you pray daily for the grace of a holy, happy, and provided for death, namely the first one, to not die with unrepentant mortal sin on your soul. That's number one. I, you know, I've been close to death that was unexpected. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Twice, twice. Uh, once a, a guy pulled a pistol on me and pointed at my face, pulled the trigger twice. Wow. And it didn't fire, and some friends of mine had a pistol, and they shot at him in a way to discourage him from doing that anymore. He ran away. <laughs> and, you know, in that time, you know, I um, didn't, I, I went home from that yeah. with two senses. One, uh, my guardian angel must have very high blood pressure. <laughs> that was <laughs> close. This guy's clicking a trigger and it's not going yeah. off. Secondly, I said an expletive that made me sound like I belonged on the staff of CNN. <laughs> and I realized, you know, to my, I said to myself, those are the last words you want before you see Jesus and his mama? Yeah. Are yeah. you stupid? Yeah, yep. You know, and, and I was. Um, and I resolved at that point that if you ever get close again, get in Lord have mercy. Yeah. And if you got time, do an act of contrition. Right, absolutely. And yeah. the second time I had a little more time to think about that when I had my heart attack. Yeah. I got in the act of contrition and two Hail Marys. Couldn't do more than that. But, you know, that was, you know, it, it, it's important yeah. to think it through. Absolutely. Remember, as to what you're going to do. And your second near case is the one I'm familiar with is, is the heart attack. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. And so. thanks be to God, yeah. um, Father Joseph was able to get there. Yeah, and amen. Get, you know, I could go to confession and get... Uh, uh, the anointing of the sick. You know, to aid us in being eternity minded, again, in a joyful anticipatory way regarding the church's eschatology, the four last things, in the fifth chapter, I list the necessities uh, in the plural regarding the necessity of the spiritual life in the singular, the title of the fifth chapter. For example, monthly confession just 12 times a year, say in honor of the first Friday devotion to the Sacred Heart or in honor of the first Saturday devotion in honor of the Immaculate Heart, 12 times a year, even if you're not aware of mortal sin, make it a devotional confession where just venial sins are confessed. Weekly Eucharist, by that I mean Sunday obligation mass. And, and by the way, for the confession, yeah. if you have any doubts as to whether you have any sins, Ask your spouse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They'll tell you. Or in religious life, ask your fellow conference. Yes, there you go. <laughs> As, uh, Father of Mercy knows about that, and a Jesuit knows about that. That's uh, exactly but right. monthly confession, weekly Eucharist, um, the morning offering upon rising. How do you know that's not going to be your last day? There's some beautiful traditional morning offerings, say, in honor of the Sacred Heart. Um, how about uh, the daily rosary? Five decades a day remains the norm. John Paul II was clear about that <laughs> in Rosarium Virginis Mariae. Mm -hmm. Five decades a day. Either 
either the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious, or the luminous. How about a, a Divine Mercy Chaplet daily? Just a seven minute exercise. You use a regular rosary uh, to, to pray it because it has five decades as well. Uh, go on a rosary walk with your spouse, uh, a, a chaplet walk with your family on, on a beautiful early summer evening. Um, the aspiratory prayers said throughout the day, you're, you're about to walk into Walmart. Uh, you know, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I love you, save souls. Pick one and stick with it for the day or pick one and stick with it for the week. Uh, my guardian angel, protect me. So the aspiratory prayers that we, and so forth, they, they help you keep eternity minded because they help you practice mm -hmm. the presence of God. Um, how about fasting according to the mind of the church? A very simple rule, uh, two small meals and one sustaining meal and that's it with nothing in between except for water or medication that you have to take and the two smaller meals do not quite equal the one sustaining meal. Well, heck, I do that practically every day to begin with just for health purposes, let alone for fasting purposes. Um, how about the use of sacramentals? Another beautiful uh, practice to help us stay eternity minded, wearing the patron saint medal of your, of your confirmation or baptismal patron saint. Again, praying the rosary as a sacramental, having your rosary blessed. Lexio Divina, a chapter of scripture a day, etc. There's all kinds of ways mm -hmm. to stay eternity minded. And, and these are tools that are part of the patrimony of Holy Mother Church, mm -hmm. part of her patrimony that have been handed down through the centuries, uh, through the wisdom of the fathers in their writings. There's another one, read the church fathers. Uh, they're very liturgically minded, how to form one's life around the entire liturgical year, which was the last topic you and I shared here on your show was the liturgical year, Father Mitch. Um, the, the fathers are masters at that. And so there's all kinds of ways that we can do that. Um, and, and this is what I wanted to bring out in the book. And see, that's, that's part of the point I was making. If, if heaven is your goal, you're going to start looking for those things that prepare exactly. you for it yeah. and remind you of yeah. it. That's right. You know, the kind of pictures that you have in your home, yeah. are they oriented towards lifting your heart toward God yeah. or uh, and, and to getting to heaven? Do you have yeah. images of the Blessed Mother and the saints? Yeah with whom you hope to spend eternity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's or, good to get started knowing them now. Yeah. Having friends there, you yeah. know, this is important. Yeah. If, if our goal is eternity with the triune Godhead and the angels and saints for all eternity, doesn't it make sense that we should try to get to know the three divine persons and the angels and saints now while still living on earth for this average of 78 and a half years, which are the the latest longevity statistics for men and women. women so it's going at, down. Yeah, it's, it's going down. Women, mm -hmm. women live an average of 78.8 years, men an average of 78.4 years. So women still have a few months on us men, Father Mitch, okay? But uh, what are they picking up our bad habits? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But this average is 78 years. How are you gonna live it now, especially from the age of reason and beyond? So I like to joke 71 years. How are you gonna live these 71 years, meaning from the age of seven to 78? Are you gonna live it for God or against God? towards this uh, good or this evil, towards these virtues or these vices, towards these things of your betterment or towards these things of your detriment. You know, these are the, these are the choices we make. You know, um, one big misnomer, or it's not known at all, uh, regarding the particular judgment and the general judgment is this. The well, first of all, what do you mean by particular versus sure, general? Sure. Explain that. The particular judgment is when you yourself die, when the individual dies, him or her, the individual person, and they are judged before God based yep. on their life. All right. At the general judgment, the church teaches, in fact, one of your Jesuit brothers, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, wrote a great treatise on this doctrine that I'm about to talk about right now. At the general judgment, which is at the second coming, the great parousia, the second coming of Christ, the general judgment, one's particular judgment is ratified for all to see and know what it is and why it is what it is. Now, for those who are saved, the church's doctrine tells us very beautifully, this will be no source of shame for them. Why? Because having their whole life revealed, they're saved now I'm talking about, having their whole life revealed at the general judgment will show forth precisely how God's mercy worked in their life and how they accepted it. But for those who are reprobated, for those who are damned at their particular judgment, at, their general, at the general judgment, when their life is made known before all as to what it is and why it is what it is, their reprobation or damnation, this will be a great source of shame, ridicule, and persecution for them. Why? Because their life will precisely show how they rejected God's mercy and did not accept it. That's why I often, when I think of, uh, of hell, I always think of the Jerry Springer show. 
<laughs> where you come up there with all the people that you've been sinning with, and then yeah. the audience yeah. makes fun of you. Yeah. That's how. That's yeah. the first day of hell. Yeah, there you have it. Because uh, the devils can, will be laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And laughing. you can imagine yeah. what role Jerry plays. Yeah. But the the thing that uh, we we you know have to have a sense is that what happens in Las Vegas does not stay there. Right, right, right. It does not. You know, that that is, is false advertising. Yeah. God will make sure that what you did anywhere, whether yeah. it's Las Vegas or anywhere else, this is going to be something yeah. that uh, we bring with us to the judgment. Yeah. You know, Dante's Inferno talks about the devil's laughing at those who are yes. in hell yes. uh, because they can do nothing about it. And of course, the, the greatest torment in hell will be eternal separation from God mm -hmm. and knowing that you can do nothing about it. And you know. being with people who hate yes, you. Yes, absolutely. All the souls yeah. in hell yeah. will hate you. Uh, yeah. uh, we were talking, uh, I was at a meeting and there was a politician who described how a guy went down to hell. It was, you know, bars, casinos, all kinds of loose yeah. people, men and women alike, and then he went up to heaven. It was f quiet but and peaceful, but compared to that, boring. Just like, yeah. ah, I want to go to hell. So he goes yeah. back, and there's the flames yeah. and, and the sulfur. And he said, wait a minute, what happened? Yeah. And the devil said, oh, when you first came here, we were campaigning. Oh. Okay. Now we That's, won the election, so right, right. Yeah, 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 this is the reality. Yeah. So, like, we'll you know, elections. the last time I was here and I had some of the televised masses, um, I talked about lust in one of the homilies, and I used Dante's Inferno's image regarding lust. He has the souls that suffered from lust while living on earth. He has them lying completely <coughs> flat on their stomachs throughout all eternity. In other words, they can't look up. They, ca they can't look at, a ball, at all because it was their eyes that led them into the sin. And so by being completely flat, they're prevented from looking up anymore. And so it's almost like a secondary torment on top of the torment that you suffered as a vice while on earth. Right. You know? We have so. to take a break. It um, goes by fast. It does. <laughs> but we will be back with your questions. So please stay with us. Welcome back. First of all, I want to invite you to do what the nice folks in our audience have done. Come here and be part of our live studio audience. Um, you can do so by contacting our pilgrimage department. It's pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Or you can call them. Their phone number is 205 Two seven one two nine six six. That's two zero five two seven one two nine six six. And also want to we, we mentioned it earlier, but want to go on a little bit more sure. about you having a radio show. Have sure. you started this yet? I have. Uh, we did my third show just this past Tuesday, Open Line Tuesday. Do you like it? Yeah, I enjoy it very much. And uh, it's great with the variety of callers and emails we have coming in mm -hmm. uh, on a variety of questions and the hour just flies by, just like this one. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you've been a host for many years now for Open Line Wednesday. Yes. Yeah. And so yes, my have. coverage is, is the areas of faith, family, and fellowship and general pastoral advice mm -hmm. and general catechesis. And of course, on Monday, we have 
have John Martinoni for Open Line Monday with um, Apologetics. Yeah. I'm Tuesday with Faith, Family, and Fellowship. You're Wednesday with a Bible and Church History. Though they ask and whatever they want. Yeah, they, they, they do. They, they do. We, we, we try to we gear try them. To, we try to orient it towards. Yeah, yeah. And then Father Larry Richards is the new evangelization right. and evangeliz evangelization in general. And then Friday is Colin Donovan, and our in-house theologian uh, with theology. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a good thing. Do you like yeah. it? I do very yeah, much so. Fun. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. Fun. The radio is a lot of fun. Yeah. And I always say, you know, people ask me, well, why don't you, you know, make sure that you get this done at EWTN? And I say, I'm not in management. Yeah, right. I'm just a pretty face <laughs> on TV. They tell you to sit in the chair and go for it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I describe myself as a pretty face on TV, and that's why they gave me radio shows. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Great face for radio. So anyway, it's good to have you on the uh, open line uh, uh, radio programs. Well, thank uh, you. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time uh, on Tuesdays, just yep. like mine is 3 p.m. Right. Eastern Time Wednesdays. Yeah. All right, ready for some questions? Yes, you bet. They're Sounds chafing great. at the bit. We're going to start off with this young lady. Young lady, where are you from? I'm from uh, Peoria, Illinois. Great. Great. Peoria, is a, is a, Illinois is a nice town. Yeah. And what is your question? Uh, where in the Bible is purgatory mentioned? Okay, yeah. where is purgatory mentioned? Well, great question. First, I want to say that notice we don't talk about the five last things when we study the church's eschatology. We study the four last things because of the church's teaching that purgatory ceases at the general judgment. There's no longer a need for it. That's right. Because purgatory is about purgating one's temporal punishment, Which not means yet, uh, purging, uh, cleansing, cleansing yeah. purging due to sins that were committed on earth while living, forgiven sins, thus dying in a state of grace, but not atoned yet for those sins. Now, why is there even atonement? And I'll, I'll get to purgatory here in a moment. There's atonement that's needed because sin is messy, as the catechism teaches very clearly. Um, I can rob a bank and immediately spend the money and that same evening have complete remorse and go and tell the bank manager and the bank president that I'm so, so sorry. And, and I mean, really heartfelt sorry that I robbed the bank and spent the money even. And in their goodness, they immediately forgive me, immediately forgive me. Well, that's all fine and dandy and I accept their forgiveness. But the fact remains that there's still money now that's spent that needs to be repaid back to the proper mm -hmm. Truck. owners of that money, mm -hmm. all right? We each drive a pickup truck, Father yes. Mitch. Yes, we do. Let's say I go visit you at your house, and I go to leave after the visit, visiting of you, and I back my truck into yours, and I go up your front step, and I knock on your door, and I say, Father Mitch, I just hit your right fender with my truck. I am so, so sorry. And you immediately forgive me in your kindness and your goodness. You even go so far as to say, Father Wade, it's as though you never did it. It's as though you never did it, Father Wade. Please just forget it. I've got great insurance. I'm sure you've got great insurance. Don't worry about it. Well, that's all fine and dandy. And I accept that forgiveness you just gave me, you know, words of absolution, if you will. But what remains on the curb in front of your house? Your dented up truck. Exactly. So sin is messy. Even though it's forgiven, this uh, atonement still remains that needs to be atoned for. Now, we can atone for that temporal punishment while still living on earth. And that's our goal, is to go straight to heaven when we die. That was another misnomer that caused me to do this book on the four last things, is because a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, well-meaning good Catholics, believe that purgatory is an automatic doctrine, that it cannot be avoided, that it's automatic. No, God's plan A for you is to go straight to heaven when you die. And that is very, very possible. His plan B for you, if you will, if you want to call it that, is to go to purgatory because, again, the holy souls in purgatory are at least saved. They are assured salvation in heaven. But if at the time of earthly death one has not yet atoned for this temporal punishment due to already forgiven mortal and venial sin, then it needs to be atoned for in purgatory. Now, purgatory is not explicit in Scripture, just like the Trinity is not explicit in Scripture. Yeah, that but, word yeah. is not you. Exactly, exactly. So and I'm so glad later. That, yeah, I'm so glad this young woman asked this question. But there are numerous passages, not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well, that talk about the need for purgation after death. There's Second Mag Maccabees. There, it is a holy and pious practice and thought to pray for the dead. That's in um, chapter 15 of Second Maccabees, of Second verse Maccabees. 46. Yep. 
And then we have 1 Peter, when we talk about uh, the purgation needed before, as though through fire before one can enter heaven. Yeah, that's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Yeah. And then 1 Peter as well, though, mentions also the, the need for purgation. Jesus' own gospels, for example, Lazarus and the rich man, um, this, this great um, chasm that exists between uh, uh, Lazarus and the rich man uh, that, that cannot be crossed until one is cleansed, one is, one is purgated. So these are all passages that lend themselves to the doctrine of purgatory. Uh, the, in 1 Peter chapter 3, you, you see, uh, I found it uh, before, um, that Christ died once for our sin, verse 18, that Christ died once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might offer us to God, being put to death indeed in the flesh, but enlivened in the spirit, in which also coming he preached to those spirits yeah. that were in prison which had sometime uh, been incredulous when they were uh, waiting for, with patience, uh, for the patience of God in the days of Noah. Uh, in other words, this is a prison for all yeah. the souls that died before Christ's salvation, the good souls. Right, right. So the Old Testament saints, but they couldn't go to heaven. Yeah until Christ opened it. He went down and preached to them. And I'm sure you remember the sermon that we read in the office of the Roman Rite on Holy Saturday about, it's a second century sermon about Christ going there and preaching to those spirits. Right. And Adam says, hark. And in the- Unleashing the souls. Right. Yeah. And when you co couple that, especially with the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus, warns us against holding grudges. Matthew 5. Exactly. And uh, he, he says, Lead, don't go to the altar unless you've been reconciled. Um, because uh, otherwise, if you don't, uh, he will, your, your adversary will deliver you to the judge, the judge over to the officer, and you are cast in prison uh, where you will stand to pay the last penny. So that idea, and it's the same word for prison. So Christ in First Peter used that term for souls being in a prison, but it's not hell from right. which you can't get out, and it's not heaven from which you don't want to get out. You know, and this is why it's so important too, I believe, to read the church fathers, namely the first seven to eight centuries, because mm -hmm. they, they expound on the scriptural passages, and they were closer in proximity to the apostles than than any generation after mm -hmm. uh, the year 1000. And so it's important to see what the fathers have to say about these doctrines of the church as yep. well. I have another question. Sir, where are you from? Sarasota, Florida. Good to have you here. And your question? Uh, when my parents died, the priest came to me after the funeral and said, now you have a new patron in heaven and to pray for you. And so I didn't understand it completely. So praying to those, whether in purgatory in heaven, and then having them intercede for us. And I think you hit on that, but could you clarify that a little more? Well, it, it's hard to say exactly what the priest meant. I'm sure he was well-meaning. I do know this because I hear enough of this in my missionary travels, is that at funerals, we're very quick to canonize the person whose funeral mass it is, mm -hmm. which I think is detrimental to praying for their souls. We need to remember that to pray for the living and the dead is one of the, the, the seven spiritual works of mercy. We have 14 works of mercy, seven for the body, seven for the soul. Excuse me, one of the seven spiritual works of mercy is to pray for the living and the dead. And uh, that's important. And so mm -hmm. we shouldn't canonize a person at their own funeral because people are gonna leave the funeral and the wake uh, no longer praying for them, not even thinking to have a mass offered for them. So it's important to realize that the holy souls in purgatory, even if this gentleman's parents did go to purgatory, they are assured heaven. And we can pray uh, for the holy souls in purgatory. And remember that beautiful passage, passage from the catechism. Our intercess intercessory prayer for them is capable not only of helping them, mm -hmm. but of making their intercession for us effective, meaning they can pray for us provided we're first praying for them. But again, even if the person did die with a complete full remission of temporal punishment at the time of the early death, then they entered heaven. Again, that's God's plan A for us, is to go straight to heaven when we die. And in, as a matter of fact, one of the passages in the Bible in 2 Maccabees 15 says, it is a good 
and righteous thing to pray, pray for, for the, the dead. dead. Yes, absolutely. This is something that's very important for us yeah. to do. So to, whether to heaven directly or to heaven uh, intermediately through purgatory, the catechism teaches very beautifully, uh, they are assured heaven and that's our goal. And so we wanna pray for them regardless. And if they are already in heaven, God knows where to apply those prayers. Yeah, and, but, it, but it is something, and I think his question was, if they are in heaven, and if they're yeah. in purgatory, they can intercede for us. Absolutely. Again, this is the part of the part of the doctrine of the communion of saints, the church triumphant in heaven, the church militant still living on earth, fighting the good fight, and the church suffering in purgatory. Us to them, them for us, us to them. This real communio going on, you know, mm -hmm. it's very, very important. Yeah. And it gives us great comfort to know that we can have a mass offered for the deceased, for the dead, etc. Yeah, this is, this is a very important element. Ma'am, where are you from? Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Wonderful to have you here. And what is your question? Um, what role do our guardian angels have upon our death? Well, we know what the church teaches about the guardian angel of the individual. They are there constantly with you throughout your entire life through good and bad. They want to be called on. They want to be uh, prayed to. They want to be asked for assistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, from approved pious devotion, private revelations, which are not needed for salvation, but approved private revelation in the church, um, we know for a fact that the angels have a very, very prominent role at the end of one's life, precisely because it's the very moment that Satan wants to try to get the individual at the end of their life. Mm -hmm. Again, this is why it's so important to pray daily for the grace of a holy, happy, and provided for death, especially through the saintly intercession of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. But because uh, precisely say, it's a time where Satan tries to snatch the soul at the end of their life, it's no secret that many of the saints, for example, had fierce temptations against faith while on their deathbed. Again, St. Therese, I mentioned earlier. So the devil tries to get us at the end of life. And so the angel, the guardian angel of the individual, wants to surely help the person at that time and remember to call upon your guardian angel uh, through any illness, tribulation, trial, whatever. But especially if you have knowledge that you're nearing death, which many people do because mm -hmm. of a slow demise, say through cancer, a wonderful opportunity to get one's house in order, as St. Teresa of Avila would say, um, who also said, St. Teresa of Avila, she says, uh, I want to see God, and to do so, I must die. And what she meant by that was a natural holy death, not mm -hmm. euthanasia, obviously. But this reminds mm -hmm. me that this whole question about the angel and preparing for the actual moment of death, because the bad angel's fighting with the good angel to grab you, reminds me of what uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, uh, paragraphs 1009 through 1011. Literal physical death, that act of literally physically dying, and again, I mean naturally, or which could be a car accident or, or a slow demise through an illness. I don't mean euthanasia here. Um, the, the literal act of physically dying is the crowning act for those who die in a state of grace to be fully incorporated into the body of Christ of which he is the head. Why? Because as the chief mediator, he, the head, died. And we become fully incorporated. The cap, if you will, is our literal physical act of dying. What a beautiful thought mm -hmm. of the, the, the reality that we don't need to be fearful of death if we're dying that we know we're not dying with any unrepentant mortal sin on our soul. We might have venial sin on our soul when we die, hopefully not, but even if we do, we're still in a state of grace because it's only mortal sin that severs that sanctifying grace, that supernatural sanctifying grace. What a beautiful thought that the literal physical act, this is not a metaphor now, the church means this, the literal physical act of dying, whether it's immediate like in a car accident or whether it's through a slow demise, those who do so in a state of grace, sanctifying grace, it's the crowning act per se that fully incorporates them into the body of Christ and it's the completion of their baptism. Why? Because in baptism, we were submerged in a symbolic death or the three time pouring if it was an infant, a symbolic sacramental dying to self, rising from the water in Christ, a new person. Well, the physical death now, years later, or whenever it takes place for the individual, even with a child, when it takes place, it's completing the baptismal sacramental act, which was death only symbolically. Exactly. And it's uh, something that is inevitable for all of us. Absolutely. 
I mean, this, this is yeah. even more inevitable than yeah. taxes. Yeah. And this is where we really have a moral obligation yeah. to face it and prepare for it. And to answer for one's vocation and state in life. For example, to some degree, to some degree, not the full degree, but to some degree, a husband and father as the leader of the home, the priest of the home, the Christ figure of the home, will have to answer as to how he led his wife to salvation, how he led his children to salvation, whether or not they're saved. What did he do to lead them mm -hmm. to salvation in Jesus Christ? Or not. Or not, exactly. And, uh, and again, this is a point of, of the book. I, I want to convey all these profound truths, Father Mitch, in a very joyful way with a little bit of wit. You know, one of the parts of the book is uh, um, a news poll that I highlight that came out a couple years ago uh, on the top 10 things that people are afraid of. It was a Halloween poll, a pre-Halloween poll. And going to the dentist was number 10. Dogs was number nine. Uh, heights, uh, the dark. Places with no easy escape uh, made the mid-range of the list around number five, for example, elevators and hot air balloons and, and bridges, places with no easy escape, uh, et cetera. And the list went down. Spiders was number two. And number one, the number one thing that people are afraid of, snakes. Now, as soon as I read this poll, it was a pre-Halloween poll, I thought to myself, call it the Catholic man in me, call it the priest in me, call it the moralist in me. But as soon as I read this poll, I thought to myself, where is hell? Where is hell on this poll, on this list? Is no one afraid of hell? And just as quickly it came to me, aha, that's how cunning the devil is. That's how pompous and prideful he is. He won't put his own eternal kingdom on the list because he doesn't want people to know about it or be afraid of it. And hell is eternal. He doesn't want to put his own eternal kingdom on the list, but he's so pompous, he's so prideful, he will make himself appear on the list and not only make himself appear on the list, but make himself appear as number one. Snakes, to use the image of Genesis, the, and, ser and the serpent. The, yeah, the serpent of Genesis and Revelation 12. Yep. yep, and Revelation 12, that's right, when the woman crushes his head. So, so that's how cunning and prideful he is. And this devil, this Satan, tries to get the soul at the end of their life. And this is why the guardian angel is so important. Yeah. Ma'am, where are you call, where are you from? Princeville, Illinois. Good to have you. Great. And your mm -hmm. question? Um, I heard that having masses said for your loved ones can be more important while they're alive than after they have passed away. Yes. Could you explain that? I certainly can, because while still living, we can still merit. We can still turn our lives around and do good. So mm -hmm. a mass said while the person is still living in regards to their eternal destiny is more efficacious for them while they're still living because they can still merit for themselves mm -hmm. um, or merit for others. Uh, this is the difference between condign versus congruent merit. But meriting for oneself or meriting for another, having the Mass said while you're still living, you can still merit. Now, Masses are still efficacious for the soul after they've died, but they can no longer merit for themselves. Yeah, so. yeah, this is um, uh, something that, especially if you know someone who is in danger of death. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, or, or they're very sick. It's very important to pray for them, uh, particularly those who are not close yeah. to our Lord. That's right. Those who have ignored God, ignored His commandments. You know, uh, I know, uh, who are you to judge? Well, yeah, you know, I can observe it. It's not that I want to judge them, but I have to pay attention to their behavior right. and analyze what they've done by God's norms. Yeah. Objective, pray for them. Absolutely. Objective judging versus subjecting, subjective judging. We want to leave the subjective judging to God. But we have a right to objectively judge. If this behavior is behavior that we know through sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, is wrong behavior, it's immoral behavior, cohabitation, uh, adultery, fornication, wh whatever it is. We want to be able to steal. Lying. Absolutely. Greed, envy, any of the seven capital sins and anything that branches off the seven capital sins. We have a right to judge it for what it is objectively and help the person 
to turn around from it. And this is where fraternal correction comes in, the three hallmarks of which are that it be done privately, charitably, and rarely. You go to correct someone. You do it privately so as not to embarrass them in front of other people right. on the evil they're doing. You do it charitably because charity is the queen of the virtues. And you do it rarely because they're an adult. They gotta work out their own salvation. Yeah. And, and if every single time you see them, you bring up their fault or their vice, that's just taking the baseball bat method to them and you're just gonna drive them away further. But privately, charitably, and rarely, Rarely, we give fraternal correction to them as we have seen objectively that they're doing wrong. Yeah. You may want to say a, a little bit more frequently uh, the things that are going wrong in your small children because they don't listen. Yeah, right. The right. first time. Yeah, shortest, but, shortest attention span. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, um, and they don't know that you mean it. Yeah. But, you know, with adults, yeah, I think that's exactly right, yeah. you know, and you have to do it with, with caution and, and a certain amount of wisdom. Yeah, that's actually from St. Thomas, the three hallmarks, hallmarks of correction, and he says that uh, if they're an adult, you do it rarely. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we have to do uh, every time is come to a conclusion. We're out of time. Well, Father thank Mitch, you it much. always flies by with you. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And it's a lot of fun to have you here. And thank, thank you, you for writing this book You're and welcome. being on a radio show. If you would join me in giving a blessing, sure, absolutely. may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The Father, Father the and Son, and, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. And of course, we remind you that Mother Angelica was inspired to have this network brought to you by you. You make it possible with your donations. So please continue to get, keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we will be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.